Okay, that's got good and quiet, so I guess that's a good uh, cue to go ahead and get started, huh? Mm -hmm. Welcome to First Methodist Church. We're glad you're here tonight. This is the third part of a five series, uh, oil patch series, uh, sermon series on John and Charles Wesley. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, two have just been fantastic. I'm looking forward to the third. Uh, tonight is Wesley Unleashed to the World. And tomorrow at 1 o'clock we'll have Let's Be Real Wesleyans. And then tomorrow evening uh, is a, a symphonic drama where uh, Tom dresses up and is in costume and he will be Brother Charles singing lustily and with good courage. Yes. <laughs> uh, all righty then. So uh, a lot to look forward to. We've already learned quite a bit. I'm Jody Wallen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Memphis right now. And just a brief introduction to Tom. Tom's been a long time friend, the Reverend Dr. Tom Fuller. Uh, Tom's been uh, everything from a general evangelist from 06 to 2013. And then in the United Methodist Church, he's been uh, a student. He was at my home church in Groover for a number of years. Uh, he was at uh, the uh, Let's see, the church that you were at in Lubbock was Oakwood oh. United Methodist Church for eight years, and that's where he is now as a volunteer pastor. So Tom has done a little bit of it all. Um, he is now a, a Global Methodist Church pastor, and we're just so fortunate that he's taken the time to come here. I've heard him do Wesley before, and I have uh, no doubt that you will enjoy learning more about Wesleyanism and the two men themselves. So, Tom, without any further ado, All right. I'll turn it over to you. Ooh. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, that's just fine, Jody. Thank you, brother. You always want your friends to introduce you. <laughs> I, was, I was one place, and a layman introduced me, and he says, this says it was... Uh, uh, it says he needs no introduction, and that's probably a good thing because I've never heard of him. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that was it. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, brother. All right. You know, this is I love this job better than pastoring because when you're pastoring, you're sort of accountable for the things you say, and if you say something really stupid, well, you have to face them the next week, you know. And and here I get to come in and blow in and tell you, preaching my my stuff that I've done over and over again and and then leave. <laughs> if you don't like me, well, what can you do about it? <laughs> anyway, you can't. if you can find me, you can do something. But anyway, uh, no, I, I love preaching about this to receptive folks. Don't love preaching it to unreceptive folks. <laughs> and I know you're receptive for one reason, because you came back at 3 p.m. on Sunday, and Methodists never do that. <laughs> for some reason, you know, we ended evening church a few decades back and and I, I didn't like that. I loved evening church as a kid. And, and uh, I think it's sort of like folks, Methodists see evening church uh, as some, something like supper on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, you know, you want to say, why should I go back? I'm still full from noon. You know? and, uh, but thank you for coming back because I think that means you really care about this. Uh, and and I, I do too. I, when I went to camp, I came away feeling that what I just experienced was the most important thing in the world. Uh, it's the only thing that wh whose effects are going to still be operative after this life is over, uh, evangelism. And uh, I, um, I, I have spent the rest of my uh, life wanting to replicate as much as I could what I experienced at camp. Uh, a born again experience, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That makes all the difference. Uh, literally, no five minute period of your life is unaffected by your relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, if your mama and your daddy, when they were walking on either side of you when you were a kid, didn't that affect how you lived? Didn't it affect how you felt? Uh, how secure you felt? Well, 
how much more with Jesus walking beside you? Isn't that right? And, and I can tell some of you are nodding because you, you've done the same thing. Uh, and, and I believe this is the most important thing in the world because Wesley was all about evangelism. And uh, the same, he felt the same experience that, that we do too. Uh, he was very religious. <laughs> he went to school and got educated. He was even a teacher at a seminary, but he didn't know Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that he kind of got things out of order, didn't he? But finally he got them in order. And we're so thankful that he did because we're still talking about him. Uh, just a couple of things. I, if I put out a quarterly newsletter, my ministry is IAM, International Adventure Ministries. My motto is Christianity is an adventure. And, and it is, you know. And um, if you, I put out a quarterly newsletter. It's free. I have a sign-up sheet down here. So if you'd like to get that, I um, just put your name and information on that. Please print carefully because some some write in sanskrit and others ugaritic <laughs> seem to because i i understand them until they write out their email address and then i can't see it and also tomorrow night at the drama three or four are going to be helping me one's going to be running the, the sound one's going to be running the powerpoint and i need to talk to y'all uh you're going to be running the sound right who's going to be running the powerpoint Trisha Elrod, okay. Well, I just need to give have y'all give y'all a script each, and just point out a few things, okay. Uh, and this is sometime before before tomorrow night. All right. Um, have we prayed yet? We haven't prayed, have we? We need to pray. All right, let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love and care for this wonderful Sabbath. Thank you for this beautiful worship service we had this morning. Thank you for that choir and how they blessed my heart, and reminded me of choirs in the past when I was growing up. Oh, Lord, we want you to know that we want to be a part of the remnant. We want to be a part of the revival. We want to be a part of this new chapter that's opening up in, in Wesley's legacy. Uh, we want to be faithful great-grandchildren of John Wesley, uh, which means we want to be biblical Christians. Downright Bible Christians were his words. Um, Bible bigots was his word. And um, we want to be that. We don't quite know how to, Lord. We've been another way for so long that we've kind of forgotten how to get all excited about, <laughs> about your kingdom. So please stir up in our hearts, Holy Spirit, a revival, uh, and uh, and we will... Uh, spend our lives for you if we can figure out how with your help uh, in this wonderful church that you have. Thank you for Jody. Please be with Peggy and heal her up soon so that we can all be back together again. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want to, I'd like to just talk about some sort of some fun things. <laughs> and um, because I was pretty sleepy uh, this afternoon, and I, I bet you were too. And uh, so I want to wake myself up and uh, not get too terribly heavy like I was this morning. But I want Wesley's story, after he is converted, just reads like an adventure movie. I mean, you just can't believe some of the fixes that he gets himself into. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, uh, his life and what happened after he, he met Jesus, and then a little bit about um, uh, his, uh, his organization and um, how he, um, uh, also his personal life, that, that's as interesting as his professional life, and a little bit about America. Uh, and, and I'll just tell you the highlights of what I found were just extremely interesting to me. Uh, and, and tomorrow night we'll close with a symphonic drama. And I'll, I'll say that I want you to come. Don't expect a lot because I've never done this before. I've never seen it before. I did put on one with another actor named Roger Nelson a few years ago. He played John and I played Charles. We traveled all over the place and we had tons of fun. Uh, he unfortunately went to heaven. I mean, unfortunately died. Fortunately went to heaven. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and, uh, and um and and I was looking for another actor to play John. Never could find the right one, so I just decided to rewrite the script, rearrange the music to uh, and to make a one man play. So that's what that's going to be, and uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Now it, it's a dress rehearsal. Okay, I haven't quite learned the script yet, so uh, so I have cheat notes. It's okay to cheat when you're a preacher, <laughs> and it's for a kingdom cause. So I'll have I'll have a hymnal, and that will have the script on it. So I just want you to know. Uh, and um, uh, okay, for um, 
I told you, I told you that John Wesley said a few, uh, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. There we go. <laughs> uh, he said, he, you know, this fearless man who faced mobs, who faced opposition from alcoholics, from wealthy people, from slave owners, from clergy, from bishops. He faced opposition from all sides. And yet it seems that he fed off of the opposition. He didn't like it, but he came to understand that opposition was a sign that he was succeeding. You know, that he was very politically incorrect. Uh, he just refused to go with the flow of the organized institutional church back then. Now, you have to have institutions, you have to have churches, but uh, the institution and hallowing it can take the place of the real thing, of hallowing the Lord, and uh, that's where the Anglican church had gone uh, by his time. It was a great big institution, and folks came and went, and it didn't really matter if they came and went because it was tax-supported anyway. They didn't pass the collection plate. They still don't pass the collection plate to this day because it's an entity of the government. Uh, but anyway, John Wesley loved it. He loved high church. He loved liturgy and all that, but he saw that it was, it was missing the boat because it wasn't bringing people, giving their heart a strangely warm experience. So so he uh, he tried, he wanted so much to uh, to uh, revive his Anglican church, just like I wanted so much to revive my United Methodist church. Uh, neither of us succeeded. Uh, and uh, I didn't try nearly as hard as he did, but it kind of comforts me that, you know, if the institutional church doesn't want to be re revived, then there's not a lot you can do. And, uh, you know, Martin Luther didn't revive the Catholics. Even Jesus didn't revive the Jews. But the thing is, they all changed the world. I haven't done that, but I'm trying. I want to. Don't you want to? Don't you want to change the world? Don't you want people to look back and to say, man, that first Methodist Odessa, uh, that's where I really learned, learned the gospel. That's where I still remember those people. They're the ones who made Jesus real to me. Uh, you know, you, you can waste, we can waste our lives, you know, just sort of entertaining ourselves and uh, people will forget us uh, starting when they come home from the cemetery after our funeral. But if we live for Jesus, people will still be talking about us long after we're gone. Uh, the psalmist says a couple of times, the Lord will honor the memory of a righteous person. If you're Christ-like, and I hope there's some young person in your life whom you are intentionally trying to make Jesus uh, appealing to. Uh, and if there's not, well, get somebody. Just you're, you're being Jesus before this person. And you may never get any reward for it, never, may never see any improvement in that child. Still pick out a few people you're trying to be Jesus to. Uh, and, uh, and they'll still be talking about you long after they're gone. I, I ask people sometimes, I'll say, who, who made Jesus believable to you? Well, let me ask that right now. Who? who? Who in your memory made Jesus most memorable to you? Somebody. Who? Huh? Your mother. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Whoa. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> That's something else. That's wonderful. All right. You didn't dare miss, did you? <laughs> Who made Jesus real to you? I've got one answer more than anything else that I hear. Okay. I almost never hear my preacher. <laughs> the one answer I hear more than anything else is my grandmother. <laughs> And, and that's true with me. My grandmother, my Dr. C.A. Long, the preacher, his wife. Um, and I tell uh, little retired ladies, and you think you're all spent. You think you're all used up. You think nobody pays attention to you. No, they're watching. Or they are watching, they, even though they act like they're not. And so remember that, okay? Uh, I want to be the person that people, when they say, who, who convinced you to follow Jesus? I want somebody to remember me. Don't you? Uh, and so they'll see him in heaven. I can't think of anything more important. All right. Now, John Wesley, after he got converted, went to Germany and visited the Moravians. He said of them, he wrote back to Charles and to his older brother, Samuel Jr., uh, I feel like I am as residing in heaven among the citizens of heaven. 
their lives bear witness to their beliefs. In other words, what they talk about believing, they live out in their daily lives. And uh, he had never been uh, in an environment like that before, uh, and uh, where where it was just sort of normal and natural for them to to be like Jesus. Uh, he uh, he loved the Moravians. He considered joining the Moravians, uh, but there were some things that he didn't like. You know, he was an intellectual, and he was also very organized. And uh, he didn't like that the worship services just sort of sat around and waited for the Lord to do something. Okay, he didn't have time to wait. <laughs> he was a little obsessive compulsive, and and uh, and his mother sort of made him very methodical. You know, and and um, in fact, did I tell you where the word? That word came from the the whole, I don't think so. The word Methodist, uh, the Holy Club back at Oxford, uh, they would uh, all go to classes together, and they would come and they'd come back and go to lunch together. And the underclassmen hooted. There goes another group of Methodists. Look at those silly Methodists. And um, it was an it was an insult to them. You know, oh, they were so good, little goody two shoes, and they were walking around, and um, and he didn't like it. And uh, but finally he said, well. You know, if you wanted to defeat your enemy, join him. And so he said, we're Methodists. So, uh, and he got it from the method of his mother, and uh, she did a thorough job on him. But anyway, he, he spent some time, but he didn't quite love everything about, about the, uh, the Moravians because they, uh, uh, they, um, he thought they wasted time. He thought he saw in some some of their lives compromise, and uh, and he sent, sensed a shallow a theological shallowness. He was a, a better, deeper theologian than any of us here, and and they just weren't too keen on the scriptures. They didn't understand them clearly. So finally, he uh, they they had this Moravian society meetings. They would have regular little small gatherings where they would get together and they would pray and they would uh, admonish one another they would they would praise one another they would meet one another's needs they would say how can i how can i serve you how can i be uh jesus to you and uh, and he liked that in fact he went home and he broke away from the methodists from the moravians uh because of just a few things that he he just didn't like about him he said you know, I can. He took some things from them, but he said I can do it better. And so he came, came back to England, and uh, and he uh, he formed Methodist societies. It was in a Moravian society that he was converted on Aldersgate Street. But he never forgot the forgot the Moravians, and he and he loved them. Uh, he began realizing that if he really was seriously going to follow Jesus, he had to make some changes in his life. Uh, I told you a little bit about. Uh, yesterday about the terrible social condition in London and really across Britain, across Europe for the most part, uh, that um, that there were alcoholism was 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 a horrible problem and uh, slavery was legal all during his life. He was a rabid opponent. Um, adultery was everywhere, and and most of these vices were present in the clergy as well. Uh, but you know how clergies are; they're good old boy networks and. Uh, they sort of, uh, they sort of had this agreement that you know, if <laughs> I won't tell on you, if you won't tell on me, and uh, and um, there were there were uh, clergy who had wives and girlfriends too, and uh, there were clergy who were gambling addicts. There were many many who were alcoholics and who retailed spiritus liquors too. And Wesley began to see, as he in his heart and mind held up Jesus as the plumb line, that all this was evil. And uh, that anything that harmed people uh, is evil. When, when I got converted, it, it was very much impressed upon me that uh, whatever I do in life, I should not profit personally off of other people's weaknesses. Uh, that I should not sell anything or uh, that uh, that would uh, benefit me, but would cause harm to anyone else. I should not make that excuse. Uh, well, they're going to buy it from somebody. They might as well buy it from me. Now, that was just for me. Just uh, uh, and and that uh, same kind of impression I later found out was was Wesley too. He said, you know, if we are the true church, we we need to be not doing any kind of thing that will cause harm to people that will profit off of their weaknesses. And in fact, we ought to do. We've got to be doing something to reverse this because. Uh, uh, the Anglican churches had these great big cathedrals everywhere, surrounded by alcoholics and orphans and widows. Widows were everywhere. There was no 
no social security, there was no uh, welfare, and uh, he was very much worried when his father died that his wife would be literally begging on the street because many, many were, or they would just die of starvation or other things. So he said, we've got to start somewhere. And uh, so he opened up a thing called the Foundry. It was an old cannon factory that had an explosion and it had closed and it was vacant. So he uh, rented it for a while. He may have purchased it eventually. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, he, he set it up as a kind of a shopping mall for human needs. And he had, and this, this was just hardly done back then. And he had a clothes closet and he had a little school uh, where he started educating people. That Many, many people were illiterate back then. Um, Wesley started uh, teaching slaves to read and he got monumental opposition from the government, from the church, everywhere, because, and, and he had these classified ads in, in the newspapers of the time, uh, railing against Mr. Wesley and, uh, and these uh, slave owners and others saying, why, if, if slaves learn to read, next thing they're going to want to do is own their own land. And, and I cannot imagine what's going to happen to the, the price of coal is going to go through the roof. Uh, and uh, I mean, they just hated Mr. Wesley because in the foundry, he was teaching slaves to read. He was teaching street children to read. He had a uh, he had a thing called the um, excuse me, I hit the wrong button. Called the uh, the the um, the prim primitive physic, a, a medical clinic. I'll tell you about in a minute. But anyway, where and and he started setting up meeting houses. These were kind of little satellite offices for from the foundry, which was uh, in in London, and. Um, uh, and everywhere that they would set up, they would they would meet it for, as a society, as a worship service. They would also have little class meetings, smaller meetings, which turned out to uh, we, which from which our Sunday school evolved. Uh, the the society meeting met the worship need. The the class meeting met the personal need of of a. Uh, uh, meeting one another's needs, bearing one another's burdens, and, and Bible study. But anyway, uh, Wesley would uh, would spend um, he would he would spend a whole week in the middle of the winter uh, begging in the streets of London because he would identify worthy poor people. Now we got panhandlers everywhere, and uh, you know. You, you you can't feel guilty every time you stop at a corner, you know. Although I do, and. Uh, but but he he would if he would knock he'd go door to door and he would require his his priests uh, his preachers his helpers to go door to door to learn of the people in their in their homes whether they were Methodists or not and and to identify the worthy poor people okay like widows who who had no income and things and he would make them. Uh, uh, ministry targets, and he would he would he would spend a whole week raising money, and uh, and then he would distribute that money to these poor people. Why can't we do that? Uh, and because uh, uh, the poor we have with us everywhere. He had uh, he put this first um, home remedy uh, journal together called the Primitive Physic, and reading it today, it's sort of funny <laughs> because he comes up with some of the wildest concoctions, uh, but I have had medical people say, you know, some of these, there is something to this. I mean, this was unprecedented. There, there just was nothing like this at this time. And uh, I'll just tell you a few, uh, show you a few examples. For dull sight, drop in two or three drops of juice of rotten apples often. All right, now, I'm, now don't try this at home, all right? <laughs> For extreme fat, <laughs> use a total vegetable diet, all right? Now that's pretty good, isn't it? I knew one who was entirely cured of this by living a year thus. She breakfasted and supped on milk and water with bread and dined on turnips, carrots, and other droops, roots, drinking water. Now there's just a lot to that, isn't it? You know, now the way he put this together was he experimented with different kinds of foods. And when people that he knew that he visited who had been cured of something, he asked, what did you do? So, you know, there's always the guy you, who's 100 years old. Well, how did you how did you live to be that long? Well, I drank a you know a fifth of whiskey and drank and smoked three cigars every day. That's what I did, you know, and uh, no, I don't think so. But anyway, that's sort of what he did. He said, how did you get cured of, of the flu or of, of whatever? And then whatever the answers were, if they seemed plausible, he would write those down. And that content went into the primitive physic. 
Old age, well, I'm interested in that now. Take tar water morning or evening, tried. See, that means someone did it. Or decoction of nettles, either of these will probably renew their strength for some years. Or be electrified daily. This was in, you know, contemporaneous with Benjamin Franklin and the kite and all that. And electricity was a phenomenal thing back then. They didn't understand it, but he had an electrifying machine, you know, and he would put, he would hook people up to it and it seemed to help. Um, or chew cinnamon daily. I'm not sure about that, but uh, personally, I, I take cinnamon. I still feel as old as I was before. Uh, the plague to prevent. Eat marigold flowers daily as a salad. All right, you gardeners with oil and vinegar. Uh, the vertigo or swimming in the head. Take a vomit or two. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know, just go try it. I mean, it couldn't hurt. You know, just be careful where you are when you do this. Or apply to the top of the head, shaven or plaster of flour or brimstone and white of eggs. Tried. <laughs> anyway, uh, perhaps, but uh, anyway, uh, <coughs> uh, he. Um, he, pr he printed this up, and, uh, and he would have people come to him as a doctor, and sometimes he had to turn them away. He had so many, and uh, he refined this several times. I told you that when he got back from America, uh, failed as a missionary, he felt especially bad because his holy club uh, compadre, George Whitfield, had been succeeding amazingly like uh, as, a, as a, a traveling evangelist, which was highly, I mean, undone, back, not done back then, except among the most rank, rankest dissenters and all. It was looked down upon. But, but he was very dramatic, as so many of these guys are, and so he attracted a crowd. Um, uh, Whit Whitfield, he, he was, um, where did he go? He was, that's not a, a poor art, artist depiction. He was cockeyed, <laughs> and all of his, his portraits look that way. Uh, but, um, uh, but, he, but he was, um, he, he was very intent on, uh, on uh, uh, preaching, and what, what he would do, it, he, he would go uh, to a place uh, on the road where people, where he expected people to pass by. Everybody traveled on foot back then, or on by horse and uh, all the poor people by foot. And he would go to a place like uh, outside a coal mine. And when they were traveling from where they lived to the coal mine, he would stand beside the road and he would start preaching, say, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And then he would start singing a hymn like this. And uh, they would gather out of curiosity. And he would have these several sermons that he would preach, very heart-tugging sermons. And... Uh, and uh, and he would offer an invitation and say, if you'd like to hear more, I'll be here um, next week at this time. And uh, Wesley just considered this highly irregular and, and even almost barbaric. It was just not done, you know, among civilized uh, Anglicans and priests. And, uh, and he was very proper, okay? He was, he was no crazy fanatic, anything. Very proper and... Um, and so when he saw Whit this in Whitfield, he was shocked. Um, and, uh, but George Whitfield said to him, um, listen, uh, you're, uh, I want to go to America and start an orphanage. Uh, that, look at what I'm doing here. Why don't you take my place? And Wesley said, oh, oh no, absolutely. It's just out of the question. It's unthinkable. I can't because uh, I don't have your voice and, and I don't have your flair. And, and, and it's, it's illegal and it's just, it's just not done. And Whitfield said, well, look, just do this, okay? Tomorrow I'll be outside Bristol, let that little hill before the coal mine, and I'm going to preach. Just stand there next to me, okay? And, and see what I see and hear what I hear. Wesley thought, well, there's no, no law broken in that. So he said, the next day I reluctantly stood up on the, the rise next to my friend George. And um, he said, as the coal miners came, George began singing and then they began preaching. And this crowd gathered, 500, 600. Uh, he, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, this was on the way home from the coal mine, his first, his first uh, encounter. He said, I scarcely could believe my eyes. He says, as Mr. Whitfield preached, and I, as I, my eyes scanned the vast crowd of upturned faces blackened with coal dust, I saw 
little rivulets of tears cutting down through the blackness uh, on faces everywhere. And, and um, he said, I scarcely could believe it. He'd never seen this anywhere, certainly not in church <laughs> uh, and not outside of church either. But this was the first time he'd ever seen someone actually moved by a sermon, moved to tears. And so uh, Whitfield said, Amen, and, and dismissed them. And uh, they departed. And then Wesley went home and he had a decision to make. Uh, what was he going to do? Uh, it was highly improper, and uh, it was illegal, but it worked. <laughs> and uh, it, this seemed to be uh, that uh, a, a medium through which God was going to bring people to Jesus Christ as he had been brought uh, to him at Aldersgate. Something he wanted to do, tried to do in America, but failed, he thought. And so he went to his room and he opened up his Bible that night almost sleepless and he put his finger down like he did open the Bible put his finger down to get a word from God and each time he did it was an affirmation but with a hook in it such as Deuteronomy 39 50 go up on the mount and die <laughs> you know that was one so everyone was that way and he finally closed the book and decided that it it went against everything in him. I mean, wouldn't it you if someone said to go out on the corner and start preaching? You know how people think about folks like that. And he felt that too. And he said, but it appears to be of the Lord, so I'm going to try it. <laughs> so the very next day, he stood in the very next place all by himself. He talks about how he just had to, had to make himself get up there. And oh, it just he looked for every excuse not to do it in his mind. But he finally did, thinking no one would respond because he didn't have that voice, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and he said he preached the very same way or, you know, calmer, more calmly. But he said he got the very same response. First time ever that he preached and he saw people in tears and he saw gave an invitation and they responded. And he said, I don't know what God's doing here, but this works. So I'm going to try it. <laughs> and so he uh, got a horse and he started traveling. He loved that feeling inside of, I don't know if you've ever had it, when you lead someone to Christ or you believe you have. And, and that just meets a need that's unlike anything else in, in life. When you say the right words and you see their lives changed. And uh, um, so he, he wanted to try this other places. So he got a horse and he started traveling uh, around. And he would go from Bristol to London and, and, and then other places too. And um, he found that just about everywhere he went, he got that same response. Not everywhere. Some places, he writes in his journal, he said, I, I stood up there to preach, but the people stood off. And, and uh, he looked at me askance. You know, they wouldn't even come close. I would try to engage them in conversation. They wouldn't answer. They kind of hid their children from me. Things like, I've been treated that way too. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, and, and we know so much about him because he wrote everything down in his journal. His journals are about this, this wide. And uh, they've, they've never been all published because he writes everything he eats and, you know, every headache, everything. But, um, uh, but he, he starts traveling, and uh, he, uh, he decides that he's going to preach just anywhere and everywhere. And so he, um, he starts preaching, uh, in he finds that he will go into a city square. There's often a city cross that's elevated with steps up to it, or a fountain in the middle of a town. And so he will ride to the middle of town, he'll step up on top of that city cross, and he'll start singing a psalm or something, one of Charles's hymns, and... Um, and a, a curious crowd will gather, and he'll he has these several sermons that he uses that seem to work. He tries them out, and those that don't work, he'll discard. He learns gradually. You know, he he's very uh, uh, he's a very intellectual, educated person, and hardly anyone else is. So he learns to speak in the vulgar, he says, and uh, to kind of lose the academic uh, uh, vocabulary when he's speaking to normal, ordinary people. And it's just a trial and error thing. Uh, and, um, and as he does, he, uh, he converses with people too, and he asks them what their needs are. And, and he begins gradually to uh, apply the scriptures to the, the real needs of people everywhere. 
for quite a while, he is accepted by the, the normal, ordinary people gladly. He finds, he, he um, asks his Anglican friends, he's becoming very well known by now, his Anglican clergy friends, if he can preach in their pulpits. Would you mind if I preach? They say, sure. So he'll preach in, he said he preached at, at, uh, at uh, St. Lawrence Church, and he said, I implored them to accept Christ as their Savior. I offered them Christ. After which I was told by the priest, I will never preach there again. <laughs> I preached over at St. Mary's, after which I was told not to return. You're not fit. You're of the devil. You'll never preach again. And within just a few weeks, the door of every Anglican church in England is closed to the Wesleys. Uh, Charles is going with him now, and they're both. He was a he was a courageous preacher too, not just a songwriter. But within weeks, uh, Wesley is labeled a fanatic, a crazy guy. Uh, and um, uh, but the normal, ordinary people uh, accept him gladly, and they say, "Well, about time somebody speaks to the the issues of my heart." And uh, so uh, the archbishop threatens to excommunicate Charles uh, because he preaches outdoors. Charles fear, fears uh, that. He, he admitted that it scared him to death uh, because they're still, both, they're still Anglican priests and the archbishop has you know, life and death power over them, just about. Uh, but Charles ignored him. Uh, when when uh, the, one of the bishops uh, wrote Je Wesley a stern letter warning him this is illegal, Wesley wrote him back and he said, well, uh, you know, a lot of your priests uh, go to gambling dens. That's illegal too. You know, a lot of yours retail uh, spiritual, uh, spiritus <laughs> uh, drinks and things. That's illegal too. And uh, he wrote back and he just said, "Well, if you're gonna, you know, you're gonna treat me that way, let's be, let's have equality, and and uh, let's just fire all your priests." And uh, and said the bishop never wrote back. So so the bishop turned his head as the Wesleys went across England and then into Wales and then up into Scotland and then over into Ireland and and it began. They began doing this uh, constantly. Uh, his he went down south into Cornwall. England and uh, the largest crowd was at Gwynup Pit, which is still there today. It's a large sinkhole in the ground, and he said that's where he preached to thirty-two thousand people. He said, "There he is," and you have to believe him. Uh, and uh, he would preach on anything or in anything. He would uh, uh, preach anywhere he could gather a crowd on steps uh, or uh, on a tree stump or or. Um, on a pile of coal, anything. And uh, the more, you know how it is, the more that he became famous, uh, the more uh, opposition he drew. And his, his main enemies were the drunks in the street and the wealthy landowners and business folks and the clergy, the Anglican clergy. They hated him, and uh, you know the, the entitled and the nobodies, the the, the rabble, and uh, it, it got to be where Wesley was so organized he would or he would announce several weeks ahead of time he would plan where he was going to be, so his enemies would see these posters and uh, and they would be ready, and the clergy would pay the drunks to break up that Methodist meeting uh, when it came. And, uh, and so they would, and they would do all kinds of things. They would start riots. They would throw things at him. Everything in the world that you could imagine was thrown at Mr. Wesley. Uh, there he is. <laughs> I don't know where that is, but he's standing on a table on a chair in a two-story house with the ladies on the bottom and the men on the top, and he's preaching to where they can all hear him. <laughs> if any of you know the history of that, please let me know. But that looks just like him. Um, the, and... Um, uh, he, he, um, uh, his most famous uh, example of field preaching or incident. Oh, and he said, you know, finally he said, you know what? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, didn't he do that? He said, well, that's one pretty good precedent that I can follow. If Jesus can do it, why can't I do it? Tell the bishop that, I believe. Um, his, uh, once he was, he, was, uh, he was infamous among the clergy, Anglican clergy hated him, uh, he uh, he went back to Epworth where he grew up, and his father was buried right next to the church. He still is today, and he asked the current rector, Mr. Romilly, if he could preach. And Mr. Romilly said, "No, you're not fit. You know, you're demonic." And uh, so it it was law that if a clergy told you 
you forbade you to preach. You couldn't preach anywhere in that county or that shire. And this was Lincolnshire County, Epworth is. So he was forbidden to preach, except on private property. You can do that. So the gravestone was owned by the Wesley family. So he's used to rejection and used to bouncing back. So he jumped up on the gravestone, his father's gravestone, and he started preaching anyway. <laughs> and he started preaching and singing and gather crowd. And he preached and said, my father used to be here. In case you want to know more about me, uh, uh, I'll be here again tonight. And uh, he hopped off, came back that night. The crowd was four times that size. And he, I think he spent four days and nights uh, preaching from his father's grave, careful not to step off of it and break the law, while Father Romley was watching angrily through the window, red-faced, because he was angry and because he was alcoholic himself, and there wasn't a thing he could do about it. <laughs> and uh, after Wesley preached to several thousand in that graveyard, he wrote in his journal, I think I, I did more good in four days on my father's grave than I would have in four years in my father's pulpit. <laughs> Wesley found that the farther away he got from church, the more receptive people were to the gospel. And I don't know what that means, <laughs> but I think it still may be true. And it should, sure may be that we need to create some outposts in places far and near where we have clothes closets and, and other things. Um, he, uh, crowds would, would uh, when he was preaching, they would drive horses and cattle through the mob, uh, th through the, the group that was gathered. Uh, they would, uh, uh, they would uh, throw stones at him and throw excrement and throw uh, rotten vegetables and rotten eggs. Uh, he, he even was humorous about this one place in Winsbury where he had seven months of almost continuous riots. He said, this he wrote this in his journal the beasts were the beasts were tolerably quiet until i had nearly finished my sermon then they lifted up their voices especially one who had filled his pockets with rotten eggs but a young man came up behind him put his hand on each side and mashed them all at once <laughs> in an instant he was perfumed all over though it was not so sweet as balsam <laughs> anyway there was another place in Winsbury, he was preaching another night, and the stones flew uh, constantly while he was preaching. And it was a rare evening because he wasn't struck even once. And uh, afterwards, he, he said, uh, angels protected me. You remember John was five foot two. And uh, Charles wrote, suggested a more practical reason. He said, I think it was your lowness of stature. <laughs> you, know, you know, the Lord works with the smallest vessels for his purposes. At least I hope he does, don't you? Uh, but anyway, he, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he um, yeah, Winsbury, he, um, he, here on the, in this one on the right, you see he's got the stones flying. And over on the two are two, as a clergyman and a gentleman, I believe, and it's obvious that they have organized this, you know, and that uh, they would usually pay the thugs in either booze or money, and uh, uh, and um, as they made sure that that Methodist mob would would uh, that Methodist meeting would not uh, see its end. But really, terrible things happened. Uh, expectant mothers were beaten uh, and caused to miscarry so that the world would not have to suffer one more Methodist. Uh, the um, uh, city councils banned Methodists. Uh, once Charles walked across a land, and the landowner sued him for trespassing, and Charles paid the five pounds. Um, some were conscripted into the military against their will. Uh, they were tried in court and found guilty of these trumped-up charges. Many died in the military uh, because they uh, attended Methodist meetings. And uh, there were posters all over cities that said, if any of your workers, uh, uh, you know, uh, factory owners, if any of your workers attend these Methodist meetings, fire them on the spot. Uh, we cannot have this. 
at one place, he was in a seacoast town, and he was preaching, and that mob was all crowding around him. And the strangest thing, he said, a burly fishwife got up and stood up on the platform with him, and she put her arm around his neck, and she said, if any of ye lays hand on me canny friend here, I'll floor ya. <laughs> and they all got as, as, as behaving as as bad little schoolboys <laughs> at the point. Uh, so he said, you know, he, he wished he could have her riding with him kind of as a, as a, um, uh, as a bodyguard. Uh, a typical day, uh, oh, oh, uh, this, um, he learned about mobs. He would stand up and he would look around, he'd make sure everybody saw him, and he would spot the leader of the crowd, who was usually the biggest, meanest, drunkest one there. And he would say, excuse me, and he would walk down through the crowd, and he would walk up to the leader, and he would say, excuse me, my name is Wesley, uh, John Wesley, and uh, I, I, have I harmed you in some way that I don't recall? And he'd go, well, uh, no, you know, they're they aren't the best debaters in the world, you know. And, and he would ask him questions. Where did you come from? Why did you come here today? And he said, listen, uh, I have a friend that I would like to share, to share with you who can help you with your problems. Don't you need help with your problems? Well, yeah, sure. And, and anyway, he would sometimes he would lead him back up to the platform and say, I want you to introduce you to my, my, my new best friend here, you know, Cecil or whatever his name was. And, and for the rest of the... The, the meeting, he would stand there and serve as Mr. Wesley's bodyguard right there. You know, they all just behaved as gentle little lambs. You know, I mean, I mean, what's a mob to do when that happens? And uh, uh, oh, uh, uh oh, oh well, okay, trying to advance it. There we go. Uh, let's see, where am I? I'm completely lost in my notes. Um, uh, uh, one Anglican priest wrote him a letter, and he said, We cannot but regard you as our most dangerous enemies, the Methodists. And indeed they were. They were enemies of laziness, of pettiness, of hypocrisy, of church politics, of uh, uh, and all those things. The, the attitude of ignoring the many you know, needs that were around them. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and uh, they never did get along. Uh, a typical day of John Wesley was he would uh, he would uh, hop on his horse. He would get up at 4 a.m. and he would pray for an hour. He'd pray for two hours a day. He said, "I am far too busy not to pray two hours a day." He'd pray from four to five in the morning and ten to eleven at night every day. And he would get up and he would he would uh, pray for an hour and then he'd go to some place beside a road where people would be walking by and he would preach to them and offer an invitation. Then he would ride to someone else, to a camp or somewhere, or to an inn, and he would have lunch, and he would preach to the people uh, there. And then he would ride some uh, to a third place where they were coming home from work, and he would preach them there. And then sometime he would camp out with folks, or he would be in a hotel or in someone's home, and he would preach a fourth time. He would preach three or four times a day for over 50 years. Uh, and nothing would stand in his way. Uh, not floods, not snowstorms. Uh, there's one point, place where I believe he sets out for a, uh, a, a, a 40 uh, city preaching tour up into Scotland in February in a foot of snow, things like that, on a horse. Now, what is it you said the preacher asked you to do that was too hard? <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. Uh, this this really moved me when I read it. Um, once he's in a he is in a he's in a coach with some other people and they're stopping at places along the path and he's always looking at his watch because he get he needs to get there and at one point it's late getting off and so John Wesley takes off down the road in the direction the coach is supposed to be going and the coach finally catches up to him about three miles down the road and he can't he gets in it he was heard to say that's twenty minutes I've lost forever <laughs> anyway. Um, all right, uh, let me stop there. Do you, do you have any questions about his life or anything? Or? What exactly, other than, I guess, just preaching the truth of the gospel, mm -hmm. is what made him so unpopular? Yeah. Uh, was it his personality as well? Uh, it was the pride of the institutional church, I believe. Uh, it, it was uh, the fact 
you, you know how clergy are. <laughs> Some, you know, it's a good old boy network. And, and the more highly educated they are, the more titles they have on their names, the fancier their robes, uh, the more arrogant they become. Uh, maybe you've never known any like that, but <laughs> I've, I've known one or two. Uh, if I get that way, slap me, okay? <laughs> uh, but it, it was the pride and arrogance of the good old boy network of the Anglican Church. The institutional church, that's right. That, that was his, uh, you know, it was just this, this ensconced uh, group of, of entitled uh, men uh, and, uh, and uh, protected by law. And, you know, um, power corrupts. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he, uh, and it, it was the uh, ineffectiveness of the church, the fact that, that, I don't know where preachers get it, that all they're supposed to do is just stand up and lead you in liturgy. Okay, and that's the only job they have, and that's what they did. The sermons were political, you know, because the bishop they wanted to impress the bishop, and like just like many do today, uh, and they didn't really meet needs or anything like that. Wesley did what they should have been doing, okay, and they couldn't stand it because he made them look bad. That's what I think. Uh, and, and I mean, you ever tried to tell an alcoholic he needs to stop drinking? <laughs> uh, and I mean, it, it's. It, Kind of like, uh, like Job wrestling with the alligator. The Lord said, if you try it once, you'll think twice about trying it again, you know, because that alligator has a way of telling you he don't want to be wrestled with. And it's sort of that way with alcoholics, you know. He was just, he was addressing and, and challenging this vast institution that was not doing its job. Kind of like the government, you know. You ever tried to tell your inept uh, political representative that he needs to change and do things different? <laughs> well, yes, sir? God, was he holding up scripture and using scriptural references as he was preaching? Yes, huh? yeah, he did. Yeah, he had, he had uh, 10 or 12 sermons and, and scripture passages that were his favorites. I don't have them right with me. I'm, I've got them on my computer. But... Didn't some of the sermons he, that he was allowed in the church, he would actually Kind of some of those mm -hmm. the church. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yep. Yeah. You know, I never really saw anywhere he was ungentlemanly about it. Uh, but he, yes, he would address these issues and he would ask them, you know, why are you not doing anything about the or street orphans that are everywhere? In the house? And he would point out scriptures where they, you know, that were applicable. Uh, and, and he would always offer them Christ, offer them Christ toward the end. And um, and the priests were just couldn't wait for him to sit down because he was stirring up stuff. Um, uh, um, okay, uh, let me see. I, I gotta hurry on. Let me say just a word or two about his organization. Um, he 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 when he, he found that when he the reason we still got Methods today is his organizational genius. He found that he would leave a bunch of converts here, but he didn't want to just leave them. And so he would form them into little groups. First, he called them societies. He said, I want you to meet once a week. Okay? And, and the, the one most sober for the most longest time would be the leader or the helper. And he would organize them. He would give them, he was writing little tracts and literatures and things. And, and he, would, uh, uh, he, he would tell them what to do, He'd give them simple little ways of meeting and worshiping. And he said, now I'll be back through in three months, and I want you to give me an account of uh, how many have joined your society meeting. Okay. And so he would, he would organize his little societies everywhere he went. Whitfield later, you know, you, you have Wesleyans, you don't have Whitfieldians anywhere anymore. Whitfield admitted himself that he was just the preacher. He didn't have that organizational genius that Wesley had. He said, my followers were a rope of sand, he said. And, um, uh, but Wesley Ford, Form societies, and, and he would he would regularly work them. And he would come back and check on them, and then he would write a little account in his journal how they were doing. Some had dis disbanded, uh, some had grown. Wherever they had grown, he found out why and who especially was effective in that, and uh, and he let those he let those helpers continue on. He really didn't care if you were male or female. All right, uh, he he said, uh, uh, I care about how much fruit you bear. And uh, he, uh, I mean, who would you rather have? A, a, a female uh, preacher who wins many people to Christ or a male preacher who wins nobody to Christ? Well, that's, Wesley was finally practical when it came to his leaders. And uh, he uh, especially kind of 
helped try to educate them and he gave them copies of scripture and he told, suggested them things that they should teach. And, uh, and uh, as he did this and, and worked them constantly, the societies grew and grew and grew. And uh, they grew so much uh, that uh, he, had to, uh, he had to break them down into, into smaller groups. And the, so the society became the, the worship group and then the class meetings became uh, the, uh, the little personal study groups of 12 people or so each usually all men or all women. And in these class meetings, which later turned into our Sunday school, which really don't look much like early Western class meetings, they would be asked several, they would be ready to answer a, a, a number of questions, okay? May not ask them, but they may, okay? And one of these was, do you want to be told of your faults? Well, that's easy. No. <laughs> What's the next one? Yeah, your faults. The next one is, do you want to be told all your faults? <laughs> What's the difference in those two? <laughs> hmm, my faults. What are my faults? I work too hard. No. <laughs> I love too much. No. Well, what are your real faults? All your faults. Well, I desire somebody I shouldn't desire, <laughs> or or something, you know. And uh, Wesley discerned between those two things. And uh, do you wish us to tell you occasionally whatever is in our hearts about you? Think about this. Whatever we think, fear, or hear concerning you, I think these were actually the questions of. He he organized a third group called the bands, B A N D S, and these were those for whom the class meeting was just not enough. They wanted to really be held accountable, and so the bands didn't last for very long. But the but the societies and the class meetings did. But they were all focused on pe meeting people's needs, personal needs. You know how it is if you have a Bible study and it kind of goes to one, and, and boy, she comes and tells me what those ladies were saying and how they're praying for each other. That just meets a need that nothing else meets, and it's a real need. You know, worship doesn't meet that. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's just, if you, if you know you're going to be with a family group who's going to love you and truly be concerned over you, uh, it's going to remember when you say, oh, I hurt here and here, and, uh, and go ask you about that in a day or two. That'll change your life, won't it? And you really go fond of those people. And these groups were, uh, were um, sworn to confidence. They couldn't share things but uh, with, uh, outside the group. But, uh, but anyway, that was the, the class meeting. They, uh, they, so many people uh, started coming to the society meetings. He started building these little Methodist meeting houses, and they were very plain and ordinary, uh, not fancy like you know pillars and, and all that. Fancy's okay, but Wesley didn't because he didn't like that because the Anglican buildings were very fancy, and he said that sort of takes the place of of what really needs to happen. And, you know, uh, Jesus didn't come so that we can look at artwork, all right. <laughs> And uh, so, but, and, and all kinds of his enemies had to start sneaking into the society meetings and his foes and rabble rousers. So he, he devised a plan of tickets. He had tickets and, and your uh, society leader uh, had, to, uh, had to sign your ticket for, for you to get in. And if you either were a rabble rouser or you just stopped coming, then uh, he wouldn't sign your ticket and you couldn't get in. I still have those. Uh, he, he began r removing people from societies and classes when they wouldn't live up to high standards. Remember, this was all about uh, living moral, high moral lives, and the Bible det determines what moral is. Imagine what if we did this in the church today. And he went to Newcastle, which was having trouble. And here are the reasons why he kicked out all these people from the society. The number of those expelled were 64. Two for cursing and swearing, Two for habitual Sabbath breaking. How many of you would, would survive in this? 17 for drunkenness. Two for retailing spiritous liquors. Three for quarreling and brawling. One for beating his wife. Three for, for, for habitual, willful lying. Not just normal, you know, occasional lying. Four for complaining and evil speaking. One for lightness and carelessness. There, I, there go I. <laughs> Uh, and 29, oh, one for idleness, 29 for lightness and carelessness. And, and he'll often write, and we were, the society was the much better for it after they were gone. You know, the, the Methodists uh, in the 20th century, uh, 
decided this, they, were, they didn't like this anymore. And so they made it extremely difficult for clergy to remove members from the church. You had to go through like three years of charge conferences uh, asking permission of, of the apostate member uh, to leave. And if they said, no, leave me on, and leave my dead grandmother on too, uh, well, you had to do it. <laughs> well, um, they, they did that to keep from losing members, and they lost members anyway, and I think that's part of the reason why they did lose members, because who wants to go to a church where there is no price to pay? I mean, every organization organized for some purpose has minimum standards. The Lions Club, the Kiwanis Club, if you don't you know, reach a certain expect, level of expectation, they'll kick you out, right? Not so the Methodist Church. We take anybody, right? And that's, that's one of the new things of the United Methodist Church is that Jesus was, you know, was all about love. And so anybody and everybody can, can join the church, regardless of what they're doing, regardless of what they believe. John Wesley said, anybody may come in. All you need is a desire to flee the wrath that is to come. He would even let atheists come to a society of He'd even let them take communion. However, it was also if you misbehave, he'll usher you out the door too. It was easy in and even easier out in the early Methodists. And I sure hope the global Methodists uh, reenact some kind of way of, of enforcing this minimum standard of morals uh, and church attendance and other things for for our members. I don't know what they're going to do yet. But um, anyway, uh, we will appreciate the church. Okay, a uh, word or two about his personal life, and then I think I will. Oh, and his personal life in America, and then I'll stop. He, he fell in love several times. I told you about Sophie, Miss Sophie, uh, but he couldn't figure her out, and she married somebody else. He fell in love again uh, in, in around age 40 to a Miss Grace Murray. She was one of his his uh, helpers and uh, she was in and uh, lived in Newcastle and uh, she was a serving girl and um, he fell madly in love with her and so uh, he he thought that he might want to get married he sort of proposed to her and he said uh, uh, I, I um, oh his words were oh did I write those down? no I didn't he said uh, he said, uh, you know, I don't know if I would ever get married, but if I would, it would be to someone just like you. <laughs> and Miss Murray said, oh, I am so flattered, Mr. Wesley. She said, uh, I, I don't know if I would ever get married, but if I ever did and someone like you uh, proposed to me, uh, I would probably accept. <laughs> so was that a proposal? I'm not sure. Was, did she accept? Perhaps. But anyway, that's how he took it. And, and he was desperately in love with her, but uh, he got cold feet. Again, he had this idea that if he got married, he'd go to hell. But, and so he said, well, I, I want to marry you, but first I must ask permission of all my preachers, and that will take about a year. So she went, what? <laughs> and uh, you know girls, you know how they are, and, uh, uh, especially age you know, 30-something. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so she said, well, all right. So he took her preaching with him. He, he left her in the home of a uh, Mr. Williamson, and then he went on to preach. And when he got to this preaching location, he got a letter from Mr. Williamson and Miss Murray asking his permission for them to marry. <laughs> Don't you hate it when that happens? <laughs> and, and he's thunderstruck, and, and he can't believe it. And he rushes back to her, and he says, let's talk about this. And she says, oh, no, I really mean it. I love you. He just swept me off my feet. And so for about a year, Grace is torn between Mr. Williamson and Mr. Wesley. Which one should she marry? And when she's with Mr. Williamson, she swears his, her undying love to him. Same with Mr. Wesley. And finally, Charles, whom you'll learn more about tomorrow night, uh, says this is just awful. So Charles goes to Newcastle. And he counsels Mr. Williamson and Miss Murray to get married. And right there on the spot, he performs the ceremony. <laughs> he pronounces a man and wife. Oh, it's not fun once John gets word of this a few days later. John hears about it, and he is as destroyed emotionally as he ever is in life. And, and it sets up this rift between him and Charles. And when they finally meet, John interrogates him. And he says, why did you do that? She was the love of my life. Why? And, and John, Charles makes excuses. And he said, well, you, you, were, you were our leader, and, and you were in 
indecision, indecisive, and, and you were destroying our society, you see, by your example. He said, well, he probably wasn't setting a very good example, but, and Charles, and John says, is that the reason, or did you love her too? He was really pretty, you know. <laughs> and Charles just <clears throat> has no answer for that. We don't know. But anyway, John uh, writes in his journal how lost and aimless he is. He went, I wrote, I wrote here and here, but I didn't know what to do after I got there. He's, he does this. The only time he's out of control is after a woman dumps him. <laughs> but then about a week later, he jumps back in the saddle and he hits the, hits the road again. Uh, and... Uh, Mr. and Ms. Williamson, oh, there, there is Mr. Williamson caring for Miss Murray, or at least a picture I found that looks as it might over there. Uh, he did get married, John did, to Mrs. Molly Vazil. She was a wealthy widow in her, he was 41, uh, no, she, he was 48, I think, she was 41. And uh, he slipped on London Bridge, sprained his ankle, and he got put up in her home, and he fell in love with her, married her eight days later. He did not ask John's, <laughs> uh, Charles's uh, uh, opinion <laughs> of whether he should or not. And um, he uh, very soon realizes he made the biggest mistake of his life. He writes in his journal, I took Mer Molly, he calls her Molly with me, uh, preaching. How anyone on such a beautiful spring day can find so much to complain about, I know not. <laughs> listening, listening to my wife is like tearing flesh off my bones. <laughs> Ooh, can't you just hear her? <laughs> anyway, uh, there's, uh, you, she has a reputation of dragging him around by the hair. That came because a, a, a preacher once uh, walked up, knocked on the door, and the door was open, and he opened it, and she was standing there. Wesley was on the floor. She was holding him by his hair. He closed the door and said, I don't mean to interrupt. <laughs> anyway, uh, he finally, they were... They were together for seven or eight years. They separated, they never divorced. He wrote in his journal, my wife left me today. I neither asked her to leave, nor shall they ask her to return. <laughs> um, uh, toward the end, let me see, John rode on up till he was 87 years old, preached uh, three and four times a day, two times later in his life. Uh, organized a hundred city preaching tour when he was 87 years old, almost completed it, but he died and got a cold and died before he had finished. John, you remember he, he read uh, Jeremy Taylor's Holy Living and Holy Dying. John thought that Holy Dying was never been as important as Holy Living, and his death uh, scene was, uh, was memorable so much that many people wrote about it. As he was dying, he sang hymns and quoted psalms. And he had people, he'd come up to him and he would lay hands on them and pray with him as he was gasping for breath. And uh, it, among his final words are, are, the best of all is God is with us. And then he closed his eyes and went to heaven. And people marvel at how holy he, he, he died just as he lived. Um, and he's buried in London uh, near his chapel. Uh, on the grounds right there where he lived. Um, yeah, there he is. There's his death mask. I know a, I know a, a guy who examined the death mask and said, huh, he had bad teeth. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess, don't they all? Uh, uh, finally, I mean, and when a preacher says, and finally, don't grab your purse, okay? Because and finally, if there's any closing, any conclusion, and lastly, and in summary, okay, so lastly, no, no, or is it, is it in closing? I don't know. Um, preachers are like pilot students doing touch and goes, come in for a landing, but right before they touch down, they circle the airport again. Preachers do the same thing. I'll try not to. Uh, he never went back to America, but he sent over Francis Asbury and, and uh, uh, Thomas Pope to be general superintendents of the colonies. And um, when he, when Francis Asbury got there, and the, at the Christmas conference in Baltimore, he was ordained uh, deacon, elder, he's a layman, deacon, elder, and general superintendent in one conference. <laughs> he went the, the speedy route. <laughs> and in three days, he became general superintendent, started to call himself Bishop Asbury. Wesley got a hold of this, heard about this, and was horrified. No one had given him more grief than bishops. 
and he wrote, fired off a letter to Frank Asbury. What is this? I hear you calling yourself a bishop. Men may call me a knave, a fool, a scoundrel, and a rascal, and I am content. But in God's name, thou shalt never call me a bishop. Put a fool into this nonsense. He said. He was a bit perturbed. As, well, of course, there was an ocean between them, so there's not a lot he could do. Asbury fired a letter back, and he said, Mr. Wesley, in the time it takes to say general superintendent, I can convert two souls to Christ. <laughs> it's easier to say bishop. So we've had them ever since. English still don't have bishops, <laughs> but uh, the United Methodists do. And uh, Asbury was this tyrannical bishop. He, he appointed bishops, uh, I mean, pastors and helpers wherever uh, he wanted to, and he was very practical. But he was every bit as energetic and, and, uh, and active as, as John Wesley was. He prolifically rode and preached. He formed the camp meeting. Uh, Thomas Polk uh, did, doesn't quite, uh, Asbury, uh, let's see, yeah. He doesn't have quite the history because he was on a ship heading to the West Indies and he died at sea, so they buried him at sea. That's why, uh, uh, that's why you, uh, you don't see or hear much about him. In Washington, D.C., in a park, there is a statue of Asbury on a very tired horse. Uh, Asbury uh, formed the camp meeting, which is a phenomenon uh, in, for over 100 years in the 1800s uh, in, in uh, rural America, coming out west. Folks had little in the form of education or entertainment. So uh, Asbury and his preachers would go out and, and organize these revivals. They would, take place a week or two. They'd go out in the woods, they would construct a great big pulpit of, uh, of trees, pine trees. Sometimes they would construct four-sided pulpits with four different uh, platforms. And four preachers would preach at the same time <laughs> for an hour. And then those would get down and then four more would preach. And, uh, uh, and this would happen all day. And then, then in the evening at nine o'clock when finally the last scheduled preachers would preach, Others would, unscheduled preachers would stand up and, you know, announce the end of the world or something like that. Uh, so um, uh, Asbury had all kinds of problems with the, uh, with the camp meeting. Uh, he, he would also find that when the agape love was over, other forms of love would, <laughs> would uh, pop up here and there. And so he had camp meeting bush patrols where all night uh, uh, attendants would, uh, uh, would uh, marshals or whatever would, uh, would walk through the camp meeting with a lantern in one hand and a pitchfork in the other hand, poking the bushes, <laughs> singing hymns, stand up, stand up for Jesus, <laughs> you know, and uh, had all kinds of problems, but many, many hundreds of thousands came to Christ at the camp meeting. One of the most memorable of his preachers were, was Peter Cartwright. Uh, Peter Cartwright was an old farmer and an old drunk. He was a great, big, massive, muscled up guy. And uh, he was always getting into fights. But then he got converted at a camp meeting and he was his conversion was mighty and he became a, a mighty soldier of the cross. And uh, Peter Cartwright became a, a fearless preacher and uh, he wouldn't mind stepping on anybody's toes because he was big and mean looking and hardly anyone would, would question him, although some tried. Uh, Cartwright said he never started a fight, but he never lost a fight either. <laughs> and so he decided he would use his skills in the service of the Lord. So he was known often to, uh, to get into skirmishes. And uh, <clears throat> uh, one was that he, he wrote his autobiography and if you want to read an interesting book, read the autobiography of Peter Cartwright. Uh, there's one, was, he became famous in his lifetime. Uh, he was known be because uh, he was preaching in Washington, D.C., and President uh, Andrew Jackson slipped in during the sermon and sat down to hear it. And he just kept on preaching. The sermon that he preached was, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell. And uh, then he sat down, and the guy next to him said, don't you think you should acknowledge that the president walked in, Andrew Jackson? And he said, oh, you're right, I'm sorry. And he stood up and said, if Andrew Jackson doesn't repent of his sins, uh, he's going to hell. <laughs> and he sat down. He wasn't scared of anybody. Uh, he, he was well known, this is the last story. He, um, uh, there was a saloon keeper out in Illinois or somewhere, and he was notorious for not letting a preacher pass his establishment. So when Cartwright saw it up ahead, he told one of his riding assistants, go up there and tell the barkeeper, you think a preacher's coming down the road. So the, so the 
the assistant went, <laughs> okay, because he knew what was coming. And he went up there, and Cartwright waited. And then the saloon keeper came out, this burly, toothless guy with a towel over his arm. And he stood in the road, and Cartwright walked his horse up, and they were nose to nose. And the saloon keeper said, who are you and what's your business? Uh, the Cartwright, trying to appear humble, said, my name is Peter Cartwright, Reverend Peter Cartwright, and I'm a Methodist preacher. What's my business? I thought I'd go down that road and plant Methodist churches all the way to the coast. And the barkeeper smiled and said, evidently you hadn't heard of me. No preacher gets past my establishment. Cartwright said, well, let's talk about that. And then he got down and proceeded to trounce the fire out of the guy. In an instant, he had him on the ground, in the dust, in a chokehold, and he was beating him on the head. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, Cartwright had this practice of, when he was doing this, he would sing Charles Wesley's hymns, because it's sort of, some of them had a beat to it, you know, stand up. And this one, this wasn't Charles's, but on this one, he said he sang stand up, stand up for Jesus. <laughs> I think that was it, is that right? No, no, all hail the power of Jesus' name. He went, all hail the power of Jesus. See how that works? And, uh, and, and, and he said, between each verse, I stopped and asked, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, yada, yada, no. And so he said, okay, sinners whose love can ne'er forget the wormwood and the gall. And he wrote in his journal very, um, uh, very clinically, he said, this candidate was especially obtuse. I had to sing all the verses before he met the Lord. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jody, don't try that here, okay? <laughs> Just don't, don't think that I'm advocating this. Anyway, okay, there he is. <laughs> there he is in his young years. There he is in his old years. I don't see much attitude adjustment to you. <laughs> anyway, I wish I'd known him. Okay, well, that's about it. Um, th that's, in a nutshell, is the story of your founder, uh, which, and I hope it inspires you as much as it inspires me. Uh, I, it makes me look at myself and say, how much time I've wasted in this life, just on silly pursuits that don't really mean anything. Think what all we could be doing, uh, should be doing, uh, and we've got a blueprint already. Uh, he's already shown us how. Not the same way, you know, I mean, times are changed, but still the same basic things are in place. People are, have great needs, okay? The world has misled people. The world has told people, no, you go after personal gratification. That's what really matters, okay? And that feels good for a few minutes, but it leaves a residual consequences and broken children and things. And if we could just figure this out and realize we need to be in some way the answer to that. We need to provide some solution to somebody, can't meet everybody's needs, but somebody, some, uh, then, uh, and you get serious about that. Uh, I think to sleep better at night, <laughs> knowing that's the kind of church you're a member of, and that's the kind of servant you are yourself. Now tomorrow, in the last session, I'm gonna tell you about how we at Oakwood Methodist applied this uh, in our situation. I'll just give you a few examples and uh, things that, that we did that you could do or do versions of them uh, too, okay? I, I ran out of fingers, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's your brother. So much information we've got to get our minds around and you know, we think and we know we live in hard times. But when we hear all of these things that uh, Brother Wesley faced, uh, the hardships, the, the drunkenness, the constant being driven away and rejected, I think, you know, I haven't had it all that hard. Yeah, right. Me too. I haven't had it all that hard. And neither have we. And, you know, we're going to do a new day new time, but we can take the inspiration that Brother Wesley gave us and carry it forward to the world today. Amen. I don't know exactly how that's going to be, but God will guide us and direct us in that He will. Yep. If we follow Him, I don't think we can miss. Right. Right. We're not following the people of the world, but following God. Amen. So let's just have a word of prayer. Thank you all for coming tonight. We hope you'll come back tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And then for the music problems at 5 30 tomorrow. Yep. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. 
We thank you so much for our, our forefathers, for the people who faced so many different hardships and yet persevered. And they persevered and they were successful because they looked to you for guidance and direction. They kept the faith, they followed the Bible, and they let you speak to them. Yes. No matter what the outside world was saying. Right. Mm -hmm. May we have that same kind of courage here in our church, in our own lives, uh, in our spirits, Lord. God and direct each one of us the way you have gifted us to be. And watch over and be with us as we go home with us as we come back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.